All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everybody for joining us tonight for the National Fellow Online Lecture Series, um, which is sponsored by the AMSSM Fellows Online Education Subcommittee, the AMSSM Education Committee, and the AMSSM Fellowship Committee. Um, tonight's event, we'll be talking about mass event coverage um, and marathon medicine. Um, I'm honored to present Dr. George Chiapas. Um, to give his expert opinion and advice on this topic here for us tonight. I'll be your moderator for the evening. Um, I'm Navish Moynudin. So go ahead and uh, you can put questions into the chat box if you have them. And towards the end, we'll go through some of the questions that we have. Just a, a couple of housekeeping items for this evening. Um, a reminder for upcoming lecture which is next Wednesday evening regarding weightlifting issues and injuries that will be presented by Dr. Lee Mancini at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. And then a couple of things, the online lecture series is here to serve as an adjunct to your individual programs, educational programming, um, provide fellows with direct access to educational experiences with experienced AMSSM members and at times invited guests, experts in a variety of formats also to assist in CAQ exam preparation. We ask that you please mute your devices and microphones, turn off your video. Uh, if you have any questions that come up, you can use the chat function. And if you wanna include your name or program, that would be great. Um, I'll ask questions during the Q&A based on the questions you submit. And then after the program, please complete the evaluation, which will be sent at the end of the lecture um, in that chat box. So our guest speaker tonight is Dr. George Chiampas that I have the honor of presenting. He is currently at uh, Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. He completed his emergency medicine training at Sturger Cook County Hospital and fellowship at Resurrection Hospitals. At Northwestern, he is now assistant professor in the Department of Medicine, Emergency Medicine and Orthopedic Surgery. He serves as the executive director of Disaster Management and Community Preparedness Institute. He is the medical director of Community and Sports Event Preparedness Management. He also serves as the CMO of United States Soccer Federation, the medical director of the Bank of America Chicago Marathon, and also a team physician for the Chicago Blackhawks. So lots of titles and experience. So I'm looking forward to your talk tonight. And so without further ado, Dr. George Champas. Uh, Mavish, thanks so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Everyone can see that? Yeah. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> first, before I get started, um, it's obviously an absolute honor to um, speak to all the AMSSM uh, fellows, um, uh, AMSSM members, uh, peers, colleagues, um, and, and really, really, most importantly, great friends. Um, you know, this this uh, lecture series, I wish it existed when I was a fellow. Um, I, I think it's uh, incredible in bringing us all together and being able to share ideas. Hopefully tonight, um, this is valuable to the fellows in regards to what their expectations should be in regards to mass events um, and how sports um, and the, the landscape and large scale events has really changed over the last 15, 20 years. And, um, it's going to be a, a unique, I think next 50 to 55 minutes. Uh, it may be a little bit insightful. Some fellows might think, oh my gosh, what am I getting myself into? Um, but the reality is, is what I'm sharing with you is, is best practices at one of the largest events in the world. And, and the, the, the points and the concepts are, uh, are what are most important and realize that it's scalable uh, to the size of event that, that you potentially may participate in. So um, by no means, um, you know, should you come out of this um, with anxiety, concern, hopefully what it should do is, is really set a standard and expectations for you when you get yourself involved. So um, the only conflict I have is that I am um, compensated for my work with uh, um, Chicago Event Management and, and the events that fall under their umbrella, not only the marathon, the half, the Shamrock Shuffle, um, and, and uh, the International 5K. So 
we're going to go ahead and get started. And um, this is the city of Chicago, um, and this is Columbus Avenue, which um, around Marathon Weekend for me, like the city just is without question um, the most beautiful time of year to be able to sit um, right in the center of, of an amazing uh, city and just listen to the calm as, as we get ready for race Sunday. Um, this is kind of when I'm, when I feel like I'm in my zone um, and really invigorated in, in regards to um, putting on a large scale event, but most importantly, you know, doing everything in our power to make sure that every runner starts and, and finishes and goes home with their families and accomplishes their dreams. Um, these are the learning objectives. Um, I won't, you know, go through each one of them, but it really uh, is important for us to understand kind of the mass amount of personnel, resources, uh, emergency action plans, and how data can uh, can serve in in your preparedness on these large scale events. And then there's some additional objectives that you know look behind the scenes of the Chicago Marathon, what marathon medicine looks like. Uh, conditions that you should think about, triaging and a systematic approach, data collection, technology that drives our medical planning, uh, strategic planning initiatives that we've created and operational uh, measures that we've put in place from a safety perspective, and how safety and security really kind of is an interplay here. Um, I'm going to close up some of the screen. So if there are questions, by all means, stop me and, and, um, um, and I'll try to answer them. So the Chicago Event Management has, you know, kind of some pillars. It talks about leadership, safety, and, and customer experience. And so keep that in mind as we go through um, this talk. Um, when we used to think about disasters, um, these were the images that, that most people think about uh, in regards to that word. Um, and whether it's 9-11, whether it be it's train crashes, up in your uh, upper left-hand corner is uh, Lakeshore Drive, which is in the city of Chicago during a snowstorm where multiple vehicles were stranded and, and, and individuals uh, at the peak of, uh, of trying to get home uh, and, and different disasters that, that we equate. Um, but that has changed. And uh, I'm gonna play this small video here if I can by a second explosion. We heard two explosions. At first, I thought it was homemade bombs. There were lots of rumors circulating in the stadium. But few of the 80,000 people packed into the stands for the France-Germany friendly were initially aware of the significance of what was happening and continued to cheer on their team despite the presence of a police helicopter circling overhead. The French president, François Hollande, who was attending the game, was quickly rushed from the stadium. As the match ended, the news of multiple shootings and a hostage taking in the east of the capital spread through the crowds and an announcement over. So what has changed is um, that really the, the direction of and any of these sort of uh, disasters incidents has really targeted additionally um, venues, large scale events, ones that ones that um, can make. Uh, the news. And, and uh, that incident that I shared with you is a, a, a national team match between Germany and France. Uh, but that's not the only one. Um, but in the running world, we've had incidents um, where we've had hit the headlines as well. And in Chicago 2007, uh, for many of you, you were probably extremely young. Uh, but for us uh, in, in the AMSSM world, really was kind of the um, moment uh, where uh, precedent was set. Um, it was the Chicago 2007 marathon, which had record heat and humidity. And I'll go into some of the details of that. It was uh, my first one as, as medical director of, of, of the marathon. Um, so you can imagine um, uh, uh, me being in my first medical director role uh, with about 4, 35, 40,000 runners at that time. The heat was somewhere in about 88 degrees and humidity up in the upper mid 80s. Um, and, and we stopped that event about two and a half to three hours into it. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Hurricane Sandy, the Boston Marathon um, bomb in 2013, although in 2012, they had huge high heat and, and uh, several runners going to the hospital. Um, and then other ones that that um, are you can Google and, and see. But there's tends to be a theme about all of them. And most importantly, the key points are is that communication it can be really uh, uh, extremely poor. Information is always inaccurate or, or half-truth. Uh, bystanders can either be a benefit or, and or a burden. 
You have to ensure scene safety. You have to manage traffic and people, and you have to really establish a command center to be able to manage these events. I'm going to talk a little bit about Boston, um, just so I, I can kind of set things up for um, the rest of the talk. But um, this is in 2013, and, and on the left-hand side, um, uh, we really have extreme uh, great relationships uh, amongst each other and our peers. And uh, I'm there with uh, Dr. Bagish, who is a Boston Marathon medical director, another colleague from uh, Germany and Berlin, Chris Troyanis, the Boston uh, medical coordinator, and John Sianka, uh, uh, the former Houston Marathon medical director. And, and it was a really good day. And this is inside their main medical tent really about 150 yards from the finish line. And this is about 45 minutes to an hour before the blast. Um, we were saying goodbye. I was running to the airport. Um, it was a good day. And um, and then things kind of changed. And uh, before 2.50 p.m., this is kind of what their metrics were. Again, less than the 3% casualty rate. They had two reported uh, MIs on the course that they had saved. Um, and so, you know, generally everyone was feeling pretty good. Um, and then post 2.50 p.m., and I won't play the video, but everybody's aware of what took place. Um, there's definitely some things to learn about uh, the Boston Marathon bombing, and, and that's where we have to be really cognizant and learn from the past of any event to make sure that we really are um, preparing ourselves and understanding the dynamics that we're dealing with. Um, you know, in 25 minutes, they went from what I shared with you to what you're seeing in front of me, 264 casualties, uh, 97 victims went to that tent that I was showing you this, these images were really about 200 yards from that. And that tent became um, a, a quick triage trauma tent, uh, all the resources uh, switched to more of a traumatic uh, experience rather than marathon medicine. And the eventual outcomes were um, what you're seeing here. So there was actually lessons learned. There was something called the RAND report uh, from the United States Senate that basically, you know, looked at what occurred there and, and said, you know, look, marathons are a major event with pre-deployed EMS security and equals a rapid response. It was actually a holiday that day, Patriots Day. So there was less traffic. The bomb occurred right at shift change of hospitals. So they were able to keep both staffs uh, in, the, in the hospital. Boston is surrounded by multiple trauma centers. The bombs were outside. And so they didn't have to extricate individuals or long uh, periods of time where they were crushed uh, with traumatic injuries where they potentially might've expired. And then the recent adoption of tourniquets by EMS was a, another factor that saved lives. So let's switch to... Um, Chicago, uh, and, and we're going to talk about kind of uh, our history from 2007 and how things have really evolved in marathon medicine um, and really um, now has kind of set the standard globally uh, in, in and around mass event preparedness, um, how to look at events, uh, and really how to collaborate with key uh, stakeholders and partners. So this is the start of the marathon. I showed you kind of the images when it's really calm. And, and, and then this is at about 732 in the morning. Um, and you can see um, that there are about 46,000 runners that are going to start partaking a run across 26.2 miles of the city with 1.7 million spectators. And I'm going to give you just an idea of what that looks like. And so when you look at this, just imagine the coordination, uh, the potential target uh, that 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 someone might think would be a good opportunity for them to do something. Um, but also imagine, you know, individuals that are generally healthy, um, with, you know, that are going to participate and push themselves to the limits that physiologically everyone on this on this Zoom understands um, what potentially can happen. 20, you know, 45,000 individuals with different medical histories, uh, known or unknown, that are really now going to set themselves out and, and we're the catch basin for all of them. Well, you have to know your metrics too. And so, you know, this year, for example, we're going to have 46,000 plus. Um, that's about where we start. Um, we have a finish rate of about 95 to 97%. Um, we have a diverse group of first time marathoners, charity runners, international runners, and I won't go into the details or the, or the risk of, of, of those. Um, a lot of people think that you know, the charity runners are, are the problem. I actually don't think they're the charity runners uh, are the issue. Um, but 
but we could talk about that in the Q&A section. You should understand kind of what your environment is like every year. We know when the marathon is going to take place every year. So we know what the, the, the sunset, sunrise are, the temperatures. But of course, you know, there's outliers. And Chicago is famous uh, for either being really, really warm, uh, maybe sometimes being cold and wet. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, ideal days are, are sometimes far and few between. The other thing about Chicago that you should know about is it's a flat and fast uh, course. It's a place where runners come to set their PR, their personal best. Um, it's where records are set. Um, and so it's places where individuals really put their eyes and set their aims uh, to go out hard. Um, and so let me play this one. Oops. Actually, I am going to go back here. I think I may have messed up. Um, actually, that's okay. Let me see how I can get out of that. Sorry about this. So that, that video was really our race director, Kerry Pinkowski, talking about um, what occurred in 2007. And um, in 2007, um, again, it was an unprecedented year where um, we stopped an event really based on um, AMSSM guidelines, ACSM guidelines, um, in regards to temperature, WEPO globe, um, and really putting the city and the runners best interests in, in, in place. And it had never been done before, uh, especially to the capacity of 45,000 um, individuals. But, but while we did that and, and we reacted um, and, and did everything we can to open up hydrants, to stop the runners, to get them back into uh, Grant Park, um, it was without question a moment in time where um, as, uh, uh, as a sports medicine world, as a mass event world, um, things needed to change. Um, and, and we'll walk through a lot of the changes that took place. Um, what we did learn is this, is that marathons are planned mass casualty events. It's a marriage of sport and disaster medicine. Um, you could see that higher level coordination is needed at all fronts. You need medical best practices. You need improved communications, you know, types of special specialized physician coverage, um, and that each unique medical circumstance specific to event uh, to to these events should be addressed. We see unique things in in marathon medicine. We see acute hyponatremia that you don't normally see in um, in hospital settings, where we see really more chronic hyponatremia. We see not one heat stroke, but many heat stroke, uh, and and again things that you don't normally see in in your day to day practice. And so the answer is, how do you identify those? How do you rapidly triage them, and how do you manage them? Well, Chicago is a part of the big six. It's a part of the World Marathon Majors, which is the marathons that you see up on the screen. We have a huge amount of collaboration and coordination amongst each other. Um, there are differences across each one, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But coming out of 2007, we started kind of uh, publishing uh, some articles about, you know, the surge. And, and we published this in 2009, preparing the surge, myself and, and my fellowship director, Dr. Jaworski, where we really said that race directors and their medical staff need to account for the ex unexpected and, and extremes in weather, as well as other potential for outside threats need to be given consideration. And so this is in 2009. Um, this is 12 to 14 years ago, and, and really started um, sending the message about what you need to think about. We also started talking about and utilizing um, National Incident Management System, NIMS. And if you haven't looked at NIMS or the ICS structure, um, I would highly recommend looking at it. Consider taking the first couple courses, the 100, 300, 700 level course, because what you end up learning is the language that security, safety, public agencies really is their, is their um, guidebook with how to manage these large scale events. And so this was our command center in 2008. 
Um, you could see it, essentially what we started doing was bringing all stakeholders in, under one umbrella uh, or under one tent. Um, and that wasn't the case in 2007. We would have operations somewhere else. We would have medical over here. Um, you'd have the race director you know, at the finish line and imagine when something happens, how do you make decisions when, when all your stakeholders aren't there? Well, since that time, and, and as uh, the world has evolved, um, the Chicago Marathon has become what's called a SEER 2 event. Um, and a SEER is a, a special event assessment rating. Um, and there are different ratings where there's SEER 1 is the highest, SEER 5 is the lowest. And SEER 2 is, is a, a very significant event because with it comes federal agencies and uh, support from the government. And I can't go into with all the details, but it includes personnel, it includes resources, it includes things that you would see and not see. Um, it could be dogs, it could be um, uh, different um, resources, and I'll leave it at that. And it could, there's no other SEER uh, um, 1 event um, or SEER 2 event uh, in the city of Chicago other than the Chicago Marathon. Um, to give you an example, the Super Bowl is, is at that same level. So what involves like a unified command and who should be involved in, in that? Well, it's all these agencies and more. And so I won't go through all of them. You could see them, but you know, some of them are Chicago police, Chicago fire, our office of emergency management, mayor's office of special event, um, any agency that you can think of in a city is involved. Uh, Mabus is mutual aid box. That means the suburban agent, uh, suburban ambulance companies and, and uh, um, uh, their fire departments. Uh, Department of Homeland Security, FBI, Secret Service uh, for ours. Um, and imagine bringing all of them together months in advance uh, to put together a plan in a coordinated fashion. And, you know, again, uh, it, it's an organizing of all of these, uh, these stakeholders uh, for these sorts of events. But also with it comes building incident action plans. And it's not just, it's a single plan, but each one of those agencies really provides their own incident action plan to become an overriding um, incident action plan for the entire event. And something that for our fellows should understand is this model applies to any event that is over a thousand participants. Again, it's scalable. You can do a 5K and if it's 2000 or 2,500 runners in a small town, you just make sure that you have a communication system. You make sure that security is at, at the table, fire and EMS is, public health is. Um, it's, it is that scalability that, that allows you to be able to make rapid decisions in the benefit of, of runner safety, public safety, and be able to manage uh, your objectives and goals particular to that event. So um, this, these are some of my responsibilities as, as a medical director. Um, Obviously, it is uh, much more than a lot of this stuff, but it just gives you a sense of uh, the responsibilities that we have. The incident action plan involves all of these and then some. Uh, it seems to get longer and longer with regards to the list. Well, Chicago is a, is a unique one, and I always get asked the question, you know, what about New York and what about Boston or London or Tokyo? And, and my response is, each marathon is different, and, and it's unfair to speak about one um, without understanding each one's dynamics um, and challenges. Um, Chicago is one where our start and finish is really in the same Grant Park location. Um, you can see on the map to your right that where the start and finish line is, you'll see kind of some additional images that give you that idea of we can really kind of, um, I don't want to use the word protect, but we can really try to put a lot of resources around that, that area where all of our runners are at. And then we break down the course in zones. And with each zone, we could put different resources. We could have triggers. We can have diversions if something were to happen in the city of Chicago. Because what you have to understand is that we also have 10 million people that are going about their Sunday as best possible. Um, and there still could be a fire. There could still be, unfortunately, a, a criminal act. There could be a gas main leak. There could be a car accident. And, it, and if there was a car accident close to the event, the first thing people are going to think is, was this a, was this a purposeful uh, incident? And so we have to vet that rapidly as the event is going on. So these are how, this is how we think about this as you look at this map. 
New York, you think about how they run through so many different boroughs, bridges, uh, Boston, they start 26 miles outside of Boston and only six miles are in Boston. Um, and so the complexities of each one is different. So I really never um, um, discuss one event to relate it to the other one. And I think that's an important point for us um, if, if you are ever in that circumstance. Well, getting back to kind of setting the standard in 2011, um, we published this in Disaster Med and Public Health Preparedness, which talks about enhancing community disaster resilience through mass sporting events. And essentially what it talks about is, is really following FEMA's guidelines and the NIMS that we talked about and building that unified command structure. But even more importantly, what agencies should be in that command center, how they sit and communicate and where each agency should be sitting next to each other to be able to facilitate an event as best possible. This is um, our forward command on a map, but I'll show you some additional pictures. This is kind of uh, part of that, um, that, that paper that shows you again, kind of the seating arrangements, some of the toolkits that are in there, but I'll walk through that in detail. So this is what our command center looks like now. I showed you kind of what it looked like in 2008. Our command center now is, is about a 200 foot uh, long, 240 foot long tent, uh, fairly wide. Uh, the most important thing in there is that every decision maker and stakeholder uh, it, it has a seat. Uh, the information coming in is being provided to each, uh, each department and that any and all decisions that impact not only our event, but also our city at times come, come out of this tent. And you can see some of the stakeholders that we've already talked about. You see everybody identified with um, um, their vest. Uh, this is on the other side where we have uh, security, uh, law enforcement, EMS, fire. Uh, what's not in the scene is some of our federal agents, uh, uh, so on and so forth. And then you see a lot of screens uh, and information that I'll walk through some of it. Some of the screens, and this is an old picture, we probably have another three or four screens that are not displayed on this, but we have live feed from the race. We have um, uh, Chicago Police Intelligence coming in. We have resources from our private ambulance company, live feed, like I shared, helicopter feed that's up in the air, uh, both from uh, the, the TV as well as law enforcement. And then in the upper right-hand corner is our medical patient tracking system, which um, I'll, uh, I'll show you that on a couple other slides. Additionally, we have uh, city street cameras uh, that we can access uh, depending on information that is given to us. And then we can vet some of that information out um, so that we, you know, we're really deploying things based on uh, accurate uh, information. We also have a private ambulance company and, and this serves as a uh, kind of the 911 center specific to the event. So if there's a call specific to our event, it's routed into this call center. Uh, and so dispatched for EMS, uh, information that is per pertinent to our event is really coming in there so we can really bet it out. And then additionally, we have multiple, multiple tabletops. And, and what you see here is, for example, is us sitting down, walking through potentially an incident that we, we uh, put up for everybody. Uh, and then we go through a tabletop scenario. And this is just a small group of uh, fire police, us as an event, some city agencies as well. But we've had uh, tabletops where it involves upwards of about 100 to 150 different uh, individuals uh, and 20 to 30 agencies at a time. Well, we also have a huge amount of data streams coming in and um, you can see all the different information coming in that when we first started in 2008, we started trying to document all this stuff in the command center so that every half hour, we would try to update everybody on boards. And then we went from a board to uh, using a microphone. Then we went to a, um, a, a ticker that went around the command center, um, trying to give everybody um, as best we could accurate and information that they can operate from. Well, around 2009, 2010, I worked with um, Northwestern University's Feinberg uh, School of, or I'm sorry, Northwestern University's Engineering School, and we created a platform called SAFE, uh, and what it is is situa situational awareness for events, and um, this platform essentially took all those data streams, and we compiled about 10 to 12 uh, elements that we felt were pertinent for every agency in there. And you could see some of the things from the yellow is, is uh, connects to our event alert system, which I'll talk about, essentially tells you kind of race day um, um, environment. 
Um, it gives you the course and in the course, it, it, you could see where the runner density is and that's a dynamic uh, a, a dynamic uh, piece that uh, as the runners are kind of going through the city, that capacity and runner density goes with. And that's important because the city wants to know where the mass runners are, where the bell curve is, um, how do we move resources with it if we need to. Um, and then you can also see some medical information as well, um, surge at our aid stations, uh, runners per mile. And this has evolved over time, but is without question one of the best tools we've created. And you can see um, everyone operating from it, kind of getting the best information, where the start vehicle is, where the last runner is, um, where our, our, uh, our para uh, wheelchair uh, uh, participants may be, really information like that that allows us to, to, to function at a high, high level. And again, how this has evolved over time. And we also would give out situational reports. And so everyone is, is tied in through their cell phone, their email, and, and every 15 or 30 minutes, they're getting situational reports um, into their phones. And so everyone, again, is getting uh, the same information and can and function off of this. But we also have different um, resources. And you can see on the screen that these resources are tied to the surge. And so um, we have backup resources. So if we um, see that somehow we're uh, potentially going in, a, in an area where um, we are running short of resources, we can potentially trigger uh, additional resources that, resources that may be staged. If an incident were to occur, we could trigger a MABIS, which is a mutual aid box where other uh, ambulances that have been a part of the prepar uh, preparation can respond. Uh, but this gives you an idea that just from our private ambulance company, we have upwards of about 55 ambulances, uh, ALS golf cart teams, bike teams, foot teams, uh, the call takers that we talked about. And this is in addition to what the Chicago Fire Department does. And what we actually do is the private ambulance is the primary and Chicago Fire is secondary because if we were to try to use the Chicago Fire Department solely for this event, we would be not, we would shut the city down. There's no way we would be able to manage this event just with our Chicago Fire Department. And it actually would, it actually would be wrong to do that because the public's uh, needs um, are equal to our events needs. Um, CFD resources, this is just some of them. JHAT is our, our, our hazmat team. Again, they'll supplement with some bike teams and ambulances and stage other uh, um, um, resources, uh, including their uh, MCI, their mass casualty um, units, their MVU, which is a mass ventilation unit, which I'll show you as well. So resources, um, I'll try to give you a quick summary as we can, but we have on course about 21 medical aid stations, 21. Uh, there's a, a one outlier that's off the course um, all the way to your left, which is a, a rapid one that we can get some ambulances to, to, to drop off greens and yellows and then get back into the mix. Um, and then we have two large main medical tents in the finish line area. And I'll walk through some of those as well. We've actually coined everything I've kind of shared with you the Chicago model. Uh, and um, it's a, another pu publication that's come out, which really basically sums up everything I've shared with you, meaning an integrated organizational structure. Um, and it came after the uh, Bank of America Shamrock Shuffle, where we had, um, it's, a, it's an 8K race, um, about 25,000 runners. It's the largest 8K or was the largest 8K in the world. But we had uh, an incident where Mind you, these events typically happen on Sundays, um, but we, have, we had an individual who um, was on the bridge at the Chicago River where my arrow is, threatening to jump off uh, the bridge at about 7 a.m. with the race starting at 8 a.m. So we got all this information into our command center. It's Sunday. Um, we asked the Chicago Police Department, you know, what are they, you know, what's, what, what are their thoughts? Do they know anything about this individual? Is it something that they're trying to impact the race? Um, they didn't know the person was kind of tucked in the bridge, so they didn't have a good visual of, of the person, but they were sending out their psych team uh, to, to, to try to de-escalate the individual. Well, it's a Sunday. Um, the psych person was probably waking up, and we had a race with 25,000 individuals potentially going to come across that bridge. So we had to make a decision. So what we did rapidly was we said, well, we're going to change the course. We're going to go one block east or where my arrow is and then get back on the course after the bridge um, and then hit our first aid station. 
But what did we have to do? We had to tow all the cars that were on this street so that we can make sure that there's enough run, room for the runners. So we used the city agencies that was in our in our in our command center. We towed all the cars. We put uh, police officers in those areas. So when people came looking for their cars, they knew where to go. And we started literally one minute late. Um, and why is that important? It's important because in this day and age, information uh, via social media, everyone is seeing that. There's a potential anxiety. Um, and so we made some decisions that allowed us to do that, but we would not have been able to make those decisions if we weren't in uh, the capacity that we operated from. And so it's important when you when you do these events that you understand uh, what could and what might happen. So this is um, our event alert system. And it may seem very rudimentary to everybody, um, but in 2007, uh, this flag system or this color-coded system really was uh, an internal system. Uh, and Dr. Patukian, I'm sure, you know, would, would, would say that, oh yeah, we knew this and it was came from the military. Uh, it was used to potentially cancel events. Um, and so I followed this in 2007. And um, you could see the wet bulb globe temperature, which again, back then was not as forefront as it is now. So we stopped our event. Um, and in 2007, what I realized is that it was great that I knew this, but the people who needed to know this were the ones that that didn't know it. And it wasn't something that was done. And so we rapidly said, we need to change this. And we need to make sure that the people that need to understand what this means are the runners themselves. And so we created our event alert system. And starting in 2008, Again, this looked weird back in 2008. No one had seen something like this. And so it took several years for this to become just the norm in the running industry, uh, but it had to be done. And what did it mean? It meant, well, we were going to create a flag system that really kind of gave information to runners with regards to what to expect. And this was communicated as early as seven to 10 days in advance of the event. We have runners coming from all over the world. Hey, this is what you should expect. This is how you should dress, what clothes you should um, consider bringing. Um, maybe you need to think about um, your individual plan. Uh, this may not be the day that you run a PR because it's gonna be a warm and hot day. It could be cold, slippery, um, on and on and on. But it's also an event alert system that if something were to happen in our city and we need to cancel or go black, that everybody is understanding when the flag system is changed, uh, what is intended. Because it's those behaviors that um, were very challenging in 2007. We also use this with our media. So our media understands this and they're communicating on our behalf as well. And we've used this flag system and it's gone from green to yellow, from yellow to red. And runners have told us how, you know what, this flag system was great. I was on the course, I'm a first time marathoner. I didn't know what I was feeling and if that was normal or not. But then I saw that the flag was red and you know what I did is I walked more. You know what, I stopped and I said, today's not the day for me. So this flag system undoubtedly has without question made a difference in the running, uh, running space. Um, and then this is our MV you on hot days, the Chicago Fire Department can come out. This is just one resource of cooling that we use. Uh, I'm not going to a lot of the heat triggers that we have, but just gives you an idea of, of some of the things we do. But that event alert system is, is absolutely, uh, without question, an amazing tool. We have diversion zone. And so at, at every aid station, the 21 that I talked talk to you about, there's flag system. We have a DJ with pre-written announcements on the flag, green cold or yellow cold, yellow warm, red cold, et cetera. We have police communication. Our volunteers get specific messaging. We have diversion areas. So if there's an incident, we can stop and hold, meaning if, if we need to stop runners, we could stop them so that we can um, uh, either divert them or stop and hold if there's an incident further ahead that we need to vet. Um, all these things that we've trained and, and we've gone through. Our zones have identified hospitals so that ambulances know which hospitals are within their zones, on and on. Um, additionally, you have to think about course shelters. Um, if there's lightning, if there's uh, a, 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 
extreme weather or something that you need to really kind of get uh, 45,000 runners that are across 26.2 miles into large, uh, large staging areas. And so we've identified them. We've identified them on our map. We also have a name and a phone number uh, connected to those. And so that is also available to us and can be triggered. And then lastly, worst case scenario, those are also available to Chicago police. So if they need to breach those facilities, they know which ones they are for, for participants to get in. One of the biggest things that um, is a challenge for, for all of us, and, and, and if you take care of marathoners, you, you understand what I mean, is that marathoners are a unique, um, a unique patient, a unique uh, individual that some are either very educated, some are not as educated, some are novices, and where their information is coming from may not necessarily be the best information, whether it be their hydration plan, whether it be uh, their running program, whether it be how to run in heat, um, expectations. Um, did they see their physician to really explain to them what they're participating in? Did they do a, a pre-participation exam? Talk about any history of heat stroke, uh, any sort of cardiac issues. And so you can imagine when you have 45 to 47,000 runners, um, trying to disseminate that information to them is very, very challenging. Um, people have asked, well, you know, could you have a screening tool for each of them? Well, the reality is it's, it is very, very difficult to try to do that. Um, on the bibs, we've asked for people to put different information on the back, but in the United States, that's a big, big challenging issue. So we try to educate them through a lot of the tools that we have, whether it be uh, uh, articles, on our own website, pushing information out to them uh, once they register so that on race day, um, we've done everything to support them. What does our staffing look like? We have roughly about 1,900 to 2,000 medical volunteers across every discipline you can imagine. Um, and it is really a celebration of, of for us in Chicago and across the state of bringing everybody together from the sports medicine world, uh, from our fellows to uh, cardiologists, to nurse practitioners, to physical therapists, massage therapists, on and on and on, athletic trainers, uh, uh, and, and, and really coming together in what I feel is a culmination of the work that they do for, um, if you think about the charity runners that are participating, um, runners that have goals for their loved ones who passed away, um, running for a cause. And I get asked frequently, um, one, can anyone run a marathon? And the answer is no. Um, and then the second thing is, um, I will tell people is, you know, you should ask the individual why they're running. And when you get the story behind runners and their goals, it is absolutely one of the most special things um, that you can be a part of. And I'll share a small story, if I can, a, a little personal one. Um, when I first went to the London Marathon, it was an, an opportunity for me to go as a spectator. And I've always been on, on, on this side of it. And when I was at the London Marathon, I, I, I had the opportunity to stand at the finish line area, um, kind of in the in the in the grandstand. And at one point, you know, I was looking, I was looking over, and I could hear like um, a loud cheers from the grandstands. And I looked over, and and I recognized that it was individuals that were that were um, blind. And I started hearing bells of runners coming across the finish line, and the cheers just kept get getting more and more um, intense. And I finally connected that the runners were running for world vision and the individuals in the grandstands that were blind could hear those runners that were running for their cause. And for me, that moment was one of the most special ones that drives me um, to really um, excel in this space because those goals are, are quite honestly why we do what we do. So um, switching a little bit on the marathon medicine side, this is the collapsed out athlete algorithm that is in several textbooks. Uh, myself and Dr. Malik, one of my closest friends and colleagues, um, uh, we connect, we created this probably about 10, more than 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. Um, and this, you, there's several collapsed athlete algorithms, but essentially what it is, is if you see a collapsed athlete, there's kind of a quick algorithm and it's a triage algorithm that we use to try to get all 2000 um, um, on the same page. Obviously, if they have, if they're unresponsive, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a person who says really check very quickly if for a pulse. And if you see that they're unresponsive, start CPR and chest compressions and AED. That's the one um, 
segment. But if you come over and they do have a pulse and they're and they're um, uh, they're, they're not pulseless, um, then it comes down to really quick two quick things: do they have altered mental status or do they have a normal mental status? And so, how quickly do you do that? Hey, where are you? Where what city are you in? What's your name? Um, do you know what your what time you ran? Uh, what aid station are we at? If they can be um, normal cognition, then it's potentially is exercise associated collapse, which is, you know, look, you've been running for 26 miles, um, you stopped uh, abruptly. And you have venous pooling, which is essentially called, caused lightheadedness, dizziness. And until you equilibrate, you get dizzy and potentially um, either collapse or drop to your knees until you can equilibrate. That usually with, you know, um, getting their legs up, uh, their mental status stays normal. They usually um, recover fairly easily in, in about 20 to 30 minutes. The abnormal mental status are, are the ones that are concerning. And, and those are, you know, potentially individuals who are uptunded, uh, combative, um, completely confused. Uh, and that's when you're worried about heat stroke, uh, you're worried about hyponatremia, you're worried about hypoglycemia, um, and then you're worried about potential other causes, maybe a stroke, seizure, um, et cetera. And you need to really rapidly be able to discern that. Uh, and you need to rapidly discern that in a large, large uh, crowd. So what we see is potentially a two to 10% incident rate in marathon medicine depends on the environmental conditions. When you, these people started their event, they looked young and healthy, uh, and these people should never have poor outcomes. That's the world we live in. And when they have a poor outcome, uh, we're all over the media. But the person on your left, you're worried about hyponatremia. This is, uh, uh, this is essentially someone who looks like they have a low BMI, someone who may have ran or been out there for four hours plus, who maybe uh, was drinking more water than they should drop their sodium and can't comes across completely uh, uh, confused and obtunded. So this is someone that looks like hyponatremia. And the upper top is someone who had a cardiac arrest at um, aid station 14, who got CPR, shocked uh, and said, can I finish the marathon? And that's a true story. And then there's individuals who have heat stroke. And when you look at their body core temperatures, 106, we've seen core body temperatures of 108, 108.8, uh, seizures, obtunded. And, and on all of these, as you can imagine, time is the difference in saving someone's life. And at the site, these aren't people that you just put in an ambulance and you try to save them. This is where what we do uh, makes a difference. Um, how do we identify runners? We use bib numbers. Um, um, uh, elite runners have their name on it. These are all very important things for us to be able to identify runners and I'll share why. Um, this is what our medical tents look out on course. They're actually a little bit bigger now, but you could see all of our, our clinicians and, and licensed personnel also have vests so we can identify them. This is our main medical tent um, at the finish line area. This is called uh, our Balbo medical tent. The size of it is about 340 feet long and a 200 feet wide. We have an ICU and I'll share a few more pictures. You could see from the top um, how big that is. It abuts up into the finish line area, um, which is about 200 yards from the finish line area, 300 yards so that people can kind of walk and, and, and we can triage people um, as they come further down. But I'll also show the finish line area. You can see the amount of medical resources. You also see um, flags in each section. When, and I use kind of a lot of the Chicago city teams. I kind of joke about it. Like I said, depending on the year uh, that each team has, they get to go and move to the front of the tent. The Cubs have seemed to be in the back of the tent for many, many years. I'm sorry for any Cubs fans out there. Um, and then this is our medical patient tracking system, which, which I will also go into. Again, this is a flag system. I told you the Cubs are in the back, um, but you could see the number of cots. And when I first started, um, imagine being in this with it being completely crowded and, and occupied and, you know, per, you know, just kind of pretend that there's a patient in one of these cots and a loved one trying to find their, 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 their wife, their spouse, uh, their son, their daughter. Um, and how do we get that information? What if that person were to decompensate rapidly? How do I, in a area where cell phone towers, radios uh, may or may not be functioning, how can I rapidly get someone the attention that they need, even if it means getting me um, some additional personnel to help me? Well, that was my biggest fear. And so we, meet, we might, wanted to change that. And I'll show you in a bit how we did do that. Additionally, we have iStat or, or uh, the ability to do uh, chemistries. Uh, so someone who gets an IV um, automatically gets um, their sodium, 
uh, and additional uh, metrics that we can rapidly give to our clinicians so that they can make real-time decisions. And so that is a part of what we do. We also have a lot of metrics, and I'll try to fly through these as fast as I can, but you could see through the years, the temperatures that we've seen, wind, et cetera, and we usually try to uh, build our, our, our program based on this stuff. You can also see the years that were either um, um, cold uh, or hot and the time uh, that, that runners kind of were, you know, the speed that they were running at. And you could see when it's a warm year in 2008, 2007, 2010, you could see the average time that these runners were kind of running. And that also is helpful for us to say, hey, what are we going to expect? And then we actually um, talk about these metrics and share it with our, our medical staff and our city agencies as to what to expect. Um, our medical patient tracking system, um, this is a, a tool that I created in about 2009 based on what I share with you about the COTS, and this is what it looks like. The American Red Cross um, serves as our liaison. They're our partners in being able to communicate to loved ones and, and, and family that are looking for their loved ones in real time. And for example, if someone is transported to the hospital, Red Cross is immediately calling the emergency contact number um, and letting that person, letting their loved ones know um, you, your wife was running, she is uh, now going to this hospital um, and we'll literally direct them to the hospital uh, so in real time. Um, but this is what our dashboard looks like. So that main medical tent, you can see the sections. And what happens is green is um, unoccupied. Yellow is when someone is occupied in there. But if you click on it, it actually gives you that information that I showed you on the back on the, on the previous slide. So it tells you who's in there, what their chief complaint is, how long they've been in their emergency contact number, uh, et cetera. If they're in there for longer than an hour, it turns red. If they're there longer than two hours, it's a flashing red. So that gives some of our senior leaders, uh, the, if they're looking at it, to go over there and just make sure, hey, is there anything unusual? Is there something we didn't think about? Um, and it's really, really helpful. And then if you want someone to go to the hospital, it, it triggers orange. And that orange is being watched by EMS so that they can extract that individual. I can get a summary page, which allows me to basically in real time tell our city agencies what we're seeing, chief complaints, uh, total number, and I can really literally go off in Balbo and in, in Jackson. Uh, we've seen 2,500 patients, 56 hospital transports, and this is what hospitals they went to and, and, and what we've seen. Uh, so extremely valuable in, in how we manage these large scale events. We also have data that looks at kind of when, when and what time we should feel the surge. So for our course medical staff out there, we're really telling them if it's 12 o'clock and depending on where you are, hey, you're, the bell curve is, is already past you or it's coming now. Um, just distribution of transports, number of transports, um, and, and where we're seeing those things over the year and we can operate all of that. Where's our medical load at, at which aid station? And you could see kind of, um, where you see the aid stations and the mile marker, again, we could build our tents to be able to accommodate this. And we can also correlate it to, to weather conditions. So a week before we can surge up, we can plan on moving teams from let's say aid station one uh, and surge them to aid station 15, uh, knowing that they may or may not need some assistance. We published some articles, you can see this one, um, with uh, um, an AMS, uh, a, a previous uh, sports medicine fellow, Brendan Parker, and uh, Dr. Thacker, who's uh, a fellowship uh, director at Resurrection, um, on kind of the medical tent usage uh, from the Chicago Marathon from 2015 to 2017. More data from a cold year and a, and a warm year, 2018 and 2017. And you could just see in a warm year in 2017, we saw nearly 2,500 more patients on a warm year compared to 2018. Um, and the, the, it's amazing what the environmental conditions can do. The Red Cross and their medical information tent, you can see um, we have all this information for runners. It's displayed. It's on the back of credentials. If they're looking for a loved one, they call this number. This is plastered all over so people know how to get in contact with them. There's a family reunite center that has, uh, uh, it's, it directs family members to come to this tent while they're waiting for us to discharge patients um, or be able to provide them uh, uh, services, social workers. Um, additionally, we have psychologists. Uh, there's a huge amount of uh, uh, anxiety, uh, concern, fear, not only in runners who have finished the event that 
have a surge of emotions, uh, as well as potentially some clinical things, um, but also family members that are obviously uh, potentially distraught if they feel like they've lost uh, someone, they can't find them, et cetera. We're coming towards the end of the talk, but these are our spotter towers at, at the finish line area. And I show you this picture because this is uh, a little early before the finish. And then this is what the finish looks like. And I, I'm going to pause here and I'm just going to let you look at this and just think about what I talked about, hyponatremia, heat stroke, um, cardiac arrest. And imagine if something like that were to happen in this finish line area where someone has come across the finish line and they're confused, they're hyponatremic um, and they, they go down or they're vomiting or they're on the ground. And how do you rapidly get uh, resources there in that time that I told you is critically important for them. They may be a temp of 106, 107, sitting in the middle of the street. Um, and, and if we don't rapidly cool them, identify them, um, identify what the issue is, cool them on site, um, it could be a really, really um, unfortunate circumstance. So what you look at is the spotter towers. And we have these spotter towers about every 200, 150 yards. Um, uh, this is something that the Boston Marathon has done for many, many years. We've adopted it. We have also uh, street numbers. We also have personnel that are in between each spotter tower. And then we have uh, individuals that can open the gates. The gates on the right side are completely locked down for EMS purposes. And then we actually started numbering the light post. The marathon did and the city adopted it. And that allows us to rapidly identify, hey, there's a runner down at uh, light post C801 and, and we can rapidly go there. We have probably about 200 um, foot teams in these uh, finish line areas that can rapidly respond, know the collapsed algorithm and, and provide resources. Times have changed. We talked about security and sports medicine. Um, these are now uh, uh, the norm in what we see. This is a mobile command center uh, about uh, maybe a quarter of a mile away from the finish line area. You can see bags, uh, uh, dogs, whether it be bomb sniffing dogs, et cetera, police, SWAT teams. You see the salt trucks that are, are basically pr uh, protecting the perimeter, uh, especially when we have 45,000 individuals uh, all staged in the park. Uh, this has become the norm. This slide really gives you a kind of a summary of, of kind of the innovativeness of, of the Bank of America Chicago Marathon and, and what we've done. I'll share a little bit on one thing that I didn't necessarily touch upon is the cardiac incidents. We have created uh, multiple CPR training videos for the last 15 years. And what we have done is we send that CPR training video to every runner. So that's 45,000 runners every volunteer, which means 12 to 14,000 volunteers uh, in advance of the marathon. And the reality is, is, and I also work in the police department, so I've trained them, uh, all um, 12,000 police officers. What that does is it really has um, sent a notice to everybody that it is incumbent upon all of us to be each other's um, keeper. And if a runner were to go down, the expectation is that there's a response, whether it be chest compressions until an AED gets there. Um, but that has, without question, made a difference in, in, our, in, our, in our events. Social media policies, we have them. I won't go into the details, but the key thing is, is that, listen, uh, media will try to come to volunteers and try to get information, but realize that as a volunteer, you do not know all the intricacies of what's going on to the event, so you can't speak to it. We have a public information officer that is the only one who's speaking unless um, either myself or our race director are the essentially two other ones from the event. Um, and then it's Chicago police, Chicago fire, the city, uh, city that, that may be um, speaking. Finally, um, you know, we want to make sure that this is something that is built as global best practices. And um, I'm a part of what used to be International Institute of Race Medicine as their executive director. Um, it is now World Athletics. Uh, it involves many of the people I, I spoke about, but also race medical directors around the world. And, and we really try to disseminate these best practices so that if you're a runner in the Rome Marathon or uh, uh, in Taiwan or China or anywhere in the world that these best practices really have become um, most important to the running industry um, and making sure that every runner is cared for in the right way. So with that, um, I will finish. Um, I will also highlight that that's the women's world record on the right set in Chicago and still holds. Um, and with that, I'll answer any questions.
Great. Thank you so much for that talk, Dr. Tampas. That was great. I know I definitely learned a lot. Um, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and put them in the Q&A or the chat box. And I'll sort of... Abish, I can't hear you for... Oh. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? I can hear I you, can't hear you for some reason. Okay. Um, so I'll accumulate questions if you have them in the chat box and Is maybe it I'll- possible to put the questions in the chat? For some reason, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. I think other people can hear me. So if you have questions for Dr. Chiapas, you can go ahead and put them in the chat box and I'll let him sort of feel them. I'll put one in to sort of get started until other people get some. Um, Process improvements, um, the three takeaways. Um, I would say without question, uh, communications, the event alert system. I would say um, the unified command approach um, and that incident command structure without question has been uh, um, one of the greatest processes that, uh, that, that is important to everybody. And then the third thing is relationships. Um, having those relationships um, with all the stakeholders uh, year after year after year is without question um, the three, three of many processes that I would probably highlight. Um, who cares for medical needs of spectators? Great question. Uh, it's actually a shared response. And so when we sit in the command center, it really is, um, especially if it's an acute issue, if someone was having a cardiac arrest and it's a spectator, it's who can get there fastest. So for example, if there's a spectator on the course and our private ambulance, our ambulance or even our medical tent can get there, we'll send as fast as we can. And then we could potentially transfer it to the Chicago Fire Department for them to transport to the hospital. But it is without question a shared responsibility that comes into the um, command center. Can you talk about the debriefing after events? Who do you include and when have you found is the best time for that? Great question. Um, there's multiple debriefs. Um, we have one with our, our medical leads. We have about 50 to 60 on our medical committee. Uh, we'll debrief with them um, about uh, three to four weeks after the event. Um, we'll make sure that they have an opportunity to either write their uh, debrief and then we come together and walk through things that we could have done better. We keep those notes. And then we have a debrief with the city um, with all the agencies as well. Any other questions? Can you hear me now? Is Thank there an, a number ratio you use for staffing volunteers and physicians? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's interesting. Um, I think that what we probably tried to do is we've we've been at that about 1600 to 1900 um, uh, number. And it's, it's also what you should understand is that I can't predict uh, what October 8th, 2023 is going to be. Um, and so um, I, I usually staff with the expectation that it's going to be a, a challenging year. Um, because if you try to do it otherwise and staff up, it, let's say a week before it's going to be warm, it's too late. It, it, so um, you have to staff with the concept of worst scenario. Um, and yeah, there might be years where it might be cool and, and people feel like, oh, well, I really didn't see much. And, and that's okay. Uh, but the reality is it's difficult to staff late uh, as people get their schedules. So you have to think about, uh, think about that staffing. How have you been successful in recruiting over 19 volunteers? Um, that's a, another great question. Um, I, I take great pride uh, and it's very important that um, every volunteer feels that they um, are welcome that day, that they're appreciated. Um, our race does a great job in, in also making sure that that is, that is part of it. Um, we make sure that they have a great experience. We, we make sure that they understand their value. Um, and our retention is, is extremely great. It's like 70%. And that's important, especially when you have individuals who have done this year after year, because it gives you a knowledge and, and a skill set that really is protective. And so that's something to keep in mind. 
Um, are non-medical volunteers or volunteers early in their healthcare? Absolutely. We have a huge amount of students, uh, PT students, medical students. Uh, they'll, they'll serve in uh, part of the entire team. We create teams of all skill sets. Uh, so the answer is without question. So I don't see any other questions, Mavish. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I know you can hear me, so I'm just going to say thank you so much to AMSSM. I hope everyone has a safe night. Um, uh, all the best in your careers and look forward to seeing everybody at AMSSM. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I know you probably can't hear me, um, but thank you for um, speaking to us tonight and to everyone for joining tonight. This will also be available on YouTube um, to view. And just as a reminder, there will be a lecture next Wednesday night as well. So hope to join at that time as well. Take care, everybody. Have a good night.